Hey friends, my name is Steve Guttenberg. This is the Audiophiliac Daily Show. And today, well today it's all about high-end audio. There'll be some, uh, you know, side trips on this journey, but I, lo I love high-end audio, but I also love affordable audio. I love dirt cheap audio that's good, and I've covered it from time to time here. But just the, you know, the, the well, let's put it this way. Um, you know, the $99, I think it's still a $99, the shit Shitmati DAC. It's, it's incredible that you can buy something that good for $99. I, I love that. I love that shit has made so many affordable and yet great products. And NAD and Rotel and, you know, ELAC, <clears throat> great affordable gear is out there. But today I want to talk about high-end audio. And high-end audio... The way I understand it really starts with Harry Pearson and the Absolute Sound in the mid-1970s. I'm pretty sure that Harry Pearson coined the term high-end. And now there's high-end bagels and high-end boats and high-end watches and cars and blah, 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 blah. But I think it really started with him. And I don't remember what his definition of high-end audio is, but I can give you mine. High-end audio is high-end audio it is designed for audiophiles, but it is built to a higher standards with better quality parts, with fewer constraints about what things cost. Just put the best thing in there. Um, and a level of service and a level of backup that more affordable gear can't really offer. Now, I expect that most high-end companies, not all, but when you call them or you have a question, you can speak to a human being at least if you're in the, let's say, the country of origin for that high-end product. Uh, but whatever. I mean, that you can talk to a person. You don't get a phone tree. You don't have to go through press seven for this and three for that. You get to speak to human beings at many, not all, high-end companies. That costs money. It costs money to have people <laughs> can just talk to their customers. One of the reasons why high-end audio is expensive. The other thing is that high-end companies tend to offer service over the long term for their products, long after the warranty has expired. As far as I know, Macintosh, up in Binghamton, New York, will service all of their, at least audio-oriented products, in other words, pre-amplifiers, power amplifiers, I guess their speakers, not so much their digital products, you know, 20 years later, but if you have a 1967 uh, Macintosh preamp and it's getting kind of flaky, they'll fix it for you. They'll charge you, but they'll fix it for you. You try to get your, your 1967 uh, Sony receiver fixed by Sony. It's not going to happen. Even a five-year-old Sony receiver, sometimes even a new Sony receiver, it's not so easy to get big corporations to uh, attend to their customers. But high-end companies, it's kind of one of the, base, the, the main points of being a high-end company is having that kind of connection to their customers. You know, you go to a, a high-end show when there, when there were shows. Remember when there were shows? You know, you'd go into the, the D'Agostino audio room and there would there's Dan D'Agostino. You could go talk to him, ask him some questions about his stuff. That's really cool. Now, it's, it's also true for some affordable uh, audiophile products like ELAC. You, you go to a, a, a high-end show and you'd see Andrew Jones from ELAC and you could talk to Andrew Jones. But it's less common with more affordable stuff. But anyway, my journey with high-end audio, I guess, did start by reading about it in the Absolute Sound and Stereophile and the Audio Critic and also the, the, the audio magazines of the 70s and 80s. That was my, uh, let's say, entree. But I was also working <clears throat> at a high-end store in New York City, Sound by Singer, and I was surrounded by high-end audio and meeting all the manufacturers and, and, and just being in deep and feeling that people mostly men, that started these companies, they set out to make the best they could. The best amplifier, the best speaker, the best uh, turntable, the best phono cartridge. Whatever it was, they said, I can do this. Now, a lot of people tried and, and failed, but the ones that stuck around, like Wilson Audio, Dave Wilson uh, left the planet a year or two ago, but the company continues on with his son, Daryl at the helm, and I have a feeling they're going to be around for the long term. So I have 
real affection for these companies. And companies like Air, <coughs> Mix Electronics in Boulder, Colorado, and DCS in England, and MSB, a United States company. There's so many of these companies, their, their dedication to making the best, uh, servicing, uh, their, you know, helping their customers, it is truly impressive. But you know, in, in preparing to make this video, I was talking to Herb Reichert from Stereophile, and we were talking about what, what it actually means. And I said, yeah, well, a lot of high-end customers when I was selling it were wealthy people. Absolutely, obviously. But you know what? I had customers that were not wealthy. I had a, a guy who was a New York City school teacher. And this is in, let's say, the early 90s. And he spent, on a yearly basis, three, four, five, six thousand dollars a year at Sound by Singer. He loved opera. That was the main thing. He would bring in stacks of opera LPs and I'd put them in a room and he would listen for hours at a time. And not geeking out as an audiophile, just because he loved opera and he wanted to hear these records that he treasured sound better than he could ever have at home. And I'd say, sure, <laughs> knock yourself out, enjoy yourself. So anyway, there was that guy. And then I had this guy, this, this customer who was a waiter a waiter in a you know a really nice restaurant, but a waiter, and he had a really nice system. Great guy. And I had this other guy who was a baker, who was actually a, a pastry chef. I'm sorry, he was a pastry chef for a high-end restaurant. And every time he came to the store, he would bring pastry, like pastry beyond anything imaginable by <laughs> mere mortals, by average people. And he would just bring it and just put it out on a table, and he would we'd have paper plates and forks and we would dive into his pastry but he was a serious high-end customer so he wasn't wealthy the school teacher wasn't wealthy uh, the waiter wasn't wealthy but they were into true high-end audio now of course some of these guys actually the waiter was was one of the earlier customers from the early 80s and in those days it was you know pre-internet uh, he didn't have a car he was single he lived in New York City Audio and music was his passion, and that's what he directed his attention to. So, yeah, it, it comes in all, all flavors, really. But the wealthy people, well, the, well, the really wealthy customers, well, one of the things I like to point out about my, my wealthy customers is um, when I was in their homes, the, the rug on the floor cost more than the hi-fi. The paintings on the wall uh, more than the hi-fi. Probably the chandelier was more, the, more expensive than their hi-fi. So though they may have had eighty, hundred thousand dollars $100,000 hi-fis, they had a lot of really expensive things in their life. They were lifestyle people of the rich and famous. Some of them actually were famous. So um, yeah, if you're, if you're truly wealthy, you get the best toys. That's the way it works. And some of them would actually vocalize it and say, I want the best. I want stuff that will blow my friends' minds. I want them to look at it and say, or listen to it better yet, and be really impressed by it. Some of them actually came out and talked like that. So again, they, they, the wealthy get to have the best toys. That's the way it works. The waiter, the pastry chef, uh, the New York City school teacher, those guys love music and they really loved audio. And I would tell you, it, it, as I recall, it, every single one of them was definitely a music lover. But remember, this is pre-internet, pre-all that other stuff that came later. They weren't so distracted, let's put it that way. They didn't have smartphones in their pockets. They came into the store to, to listen to something or to ask questions, and that was it. There were no, there were no distractions. Of course, you could always buy used stuff, right? You could buy used high-end, save a bundle, and get there, right? Get most of it. Now, it's still going to be really expensive because it starts out really expensive, but you can, get, you, you can get closer, right? It gets to be a bit more achievable if you buy used high-end. I want to take a brief sideways trip in this video because just before I turned on the camera, I was playing this record. The Rolling Stones' Beggar's Banquet. This is the American cover. This is the one I bought probably in 1968 when it came out. I love this record. I loved it then, and I played it now. And the first cut on side to Street Fighting Man. You know, there's something about the mix of that record, that's, that tune, more than even the rest of the record, is it's just this cacophony of sound. It's just this 
unleashing of ideas and density and uh, I'll use the word incorrectly gravitas there was so much going on in this mix it's messy in a beautiful way and I've been listening to this record so for uh, 52 years and it still gets me going it's still incredible that's what high-end audio can do for people um, and audiophile gear can do for people but today, the subject of today is, is high-end audio. H having these long-term relationships with music in your life that you've carried, in this case, carried throughout my life, it's just so deep. There's so many associations, like when I bought this record, the first time I played this record, or the first time I heard it on the radio, all of these things come, come back to my consciousness. What else in life could do that for somebody over a half a century? It's freaking amazing, you know. I love the whole record. And by the way, in case you haven't seen the LP version, the early LP version, look at this this gatefold. <laughs> Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. So uh, those were the days. And those are the sort of the things, the seeds. Those, that record, other records, you know, Sgt. Pepper, whatever. They... They gave me so much, and I wanted to hear more, more and more from those records. And that's why I'm an audiophile, and that's why I'm a high-end audiophile. So if you're, if you're new to this hobby, and you're new to this channel, that's, I keep referring to this course as a journey that each audiophile is on. Now, some, some audiophiles drift in and out, they, they're, they're into it, they're into it, they're into it, and then they get distracted by other things, and maybe they even sell their audio system or get rid of their music. It's not necessarily a, a linear journey, you know, it has lots of zigs and zags. Um, but the, the thing about the time that we're living in is there's more good stuff. There's more affordable audio, there's more, you know, let's say middle range audio, more high end audio, more, more choices than ever, which is kind of overwhelming for a lot of people. How do I figure out what I want? Well, that's what I'm here to help you do and other YouTube channels and other reviewers in print or online. That's, that's what we are collectively doing because unfortunately you don't have as many options to go to a brick and mortar store and hear this stuff for yourself. I think watching a YouTube video is a poor substitute for actually experiencing high-end audio or affordable audio uh, in person. I don't think my talking or reading a review is anywhere as helpful as the real deal. But if you don't have that option, <laughs> that's what I'm here to help, help you through, help you guide you along the way as best I can. So let's talk a little bit about snake oil, shall we? Hmm. It's cynical. It's it's snide. It's it's uh, it's uncomfortable. It makes me uncomfortable because the people who make high end audio, for the most part, are passion driven. They're in it to make greatness, to make the best they can. Some achieve <laughs> some achieve that at a higher level than others, but that's what that's what drives them. They also are trying to make a living selling stuff, and they have families to feed and employees to pay, and maybe even give them benefits. That would be kind of nice, right? So high-end stuff tends to be expensive. Um, is, it a, is it a value proposition? Mm, I wouldn't go that far, but I don't think buying a, you know, a Porsche or a Ferrari is a value proposition either, right? But people buy them and lust after them because of what they are. And I don't think high-end audio is really, well, at least from my perspective, all that different. Um, so if you're cynical about high-end audio, Okay, be cynical. <laughs> Knock yourself out. I mean, what difference does it make? The people, you, are you trying to convince the people who are into it that they shouldn't be? Is that your goal? You snake oil purveyors? Um, naysayers? Well, I hate to break it to you. You're not going to make any difference. <laughs> not even a little tiny bit. You're not going to convince anyone. Because first of all, looking back on my experience selling high-end audio, Many of the customers weren't audiophiles in the sense of reading magazines or watching YouTube video reviews. They're wealthy people. They want nice things. They find their way into high-end audio, and they buy stuff because they like it, because they want good things. 
and not really because of the product, the speaker, the amp, whatever, got a rave re review by me or anybody else. That's not really the driving force. The driving force is the product itself and the person or the company that's behind that product and the people selling it, you know, the stores and stuff. That's where, that's where it's at. That's where the action is in high-end audio, expensive audio systems that cost, let's say, over $20,000 or so. It's totally an arbitrary number. But many of those people who buy that stuff uh, aren't, don't care about what you have to say. Uh, so you're not going to change anybody's mind. And I don't know who you're trying to convince. So, yeah, I know you're out there. You have a right to your opinion, absolutely. But unless you're in it, that is, you're going to buy it. Uh, eh, doesn't matter, does it? It's a pleasure thing. We're, we're searching for pleasure, uh, satisfaction from listening to music, and owning nice things. That's that's what being, uh, let's say, a high-end audiophile is. Actually, what, correct correction. That's what being an audiophile is. We we're seeking pleasure from listening to music, and we like owning nice things. Whatever it is, the the hundred dollar uh, shit money DAC is a nice thing. Uh, if you get off on that, you're one of us. You are an audiophile, whether you call yourself an audiophile or not. In my book, you're an audiophile. That's it, of course. As always, I want to hear your opinions, and you can put them down there in the comments. Uh, my name is Steve Guttenberg. This is the Audiophiliac Daily Show. If you like what I do, please subscribe to this channel. We're coming in. We just hit 148,000 subscribers, so we're on track for late October, early November, hitting 150,000. Obviously, I couldn't do it without you guys, so thank you. And if you have already subscribed, Thank you so much for doing that. But there's also the Patreon, which can be found at p a t r e o n dot com slash audiophiliac, and I will definitely link to that below. Uh, there's also a playlist for speaker reviews and amplifier reviews and music reviews and headphone reviews, plus interviews. There's so many great interviews. And oh, by the way, I have, I think it's because of COVID, it slowed me down going to people's homes and shooting videos uh, in their homes. But I think I'm going to get to do one soon. So I'm really looking forward to doing that. I miss that aspect of this working on this channel is going into Audiophile's homes and talking to them about their system. So if not, if not this one, uh, I'll get to do more. I really want to, especially in 2021. Anyway, I think my work here is at last complete. Thank you again for watching, and I really do hope to see you back here again very, very soon. Bye-bye.